Hey, Cottage Coach Adam Holman here. If you know me, you know I spend a lot of time outdoors. Whether I'm camping with my family or fishing in my top secret spot, there's nowhere I'd rather be than in the wild. Sadly, we all have to head home at some point, and I'm pretty sure the mosquitoes have put a homing device on me, because sometimes they can be just as annoying in my backyard. So, when I'm in the city, I use the off backyard mosquito lamp. Whether I'm barbecuing my breakfast or having dinner with my family, I know it will keep the mosquitoes away for up to six hours. Which means I never have to head inside again. Hi, I'm Michelle Kelly, Editor-in-Chief of Cottage Life magazine. For our final episode of the season, we take some time to catch up with Roy McGregor, who we think of as the godfather of Canadian cottaging. We decode the surprising sounds that great blue herons make, and we reflect back on seven decades of life at the cottage. This is the Cottage Life podcast, where every day is the weekend. Roy McGregor is one of Canada's most respected and beloved journalists. He's been a columnist for several Canadian newspapers, including the Globe and Mail, the National Post, the Toronto Star, and the Ottawa Citizen. He's the author of nearly 40 books, many exploring the institutions that are so special to Canadians, like hockey, the wilderness, and yes, cottaging. In 2005, he was named an officer in the Order of Canada. And for the better part of the history of Cottage Life magazine, Roy has been filling our pages with heartfelt reflections of what it means to be a cottager in Canada and what cottaging itself means to our nation's culture and history. He's well positioned to write on the topic. He grew up outside of Huntsville in the heart of Ontario cottage country. He's the grandson of an Algonquin Park ranger. The park, in fact, has been a constant fixture in his life. He now lives in Ottawa, but he continues to visit his cottage near Algonquin each summer with his wife, Ellen, along with his children and his grandchildren. Roy recently retired from the Globe and Mail. We wanted to catch up with him and get his thoughts about what makes cottage life in Canada so special. Roy, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Pleasure is all mine, Michelle. So, Roy, you've written so much about the cottage in both your columns in Cottage Life and in your work that's been published elsewhere. Actually, just last night, I was reading your book, The Weekender, which is sort of a compilation of all your cottage-related writing that you've done over the years, which is wonderful. Um, All of this makes me think of you as the godfather of cottaging, which I'm not sure how you feel about that moniker. I love it. I love it. Good. I love it, too. I make you an offer you can't refuse. (laughs) Um, The first question I thought I wanted to ask the Godfather was, uh, how did you fall in love with cottaging? I didn't. I was born into it. I was uh, born at a Red Cross outlet on the uh, eastern edge of Algonquin Park, a little village called Whitney. And at the age of four days, three or four days, my mother took me up to uh, spend the summer at her parents' place. Her father was the chief ranger of Algonquin Park, and they had a beautiful log cabin on Lake Hutter Rivers. And it's not there now, but it uh, was a spectacular place. We spent every summer there, all summer, like from the moment school let out until school went back in. And uh, it was our lives. And then, uh, you know, generations pass and and life moves on, and often cottages are lost. This cottage at Lake Hutter Rivers was lost. Uh, sold to someone who dismantled it and moved it out of the park. So it's gone completely. But uh, happily, I uh, in high school, I met a new girl in town called Ellen. And Ellen and I have been married now for nearly 48 years. Her father was a teacher who loved to fish. And her father and mother built a small cabin on a small lake called Camp Lake, which is on the western edge of Algonquin Park. So from one edge of, the, of Algonquin to the other, uh, my cottage world and life has had a continuity to it. Now, I, I don't remember any that time not having a cottage, and I don't ever remember any time where uh, I thought that uh, I should be out there trying to buy a cottage or anything. I just lucked into two. <laughs> Oh, sure. Sounds like that was a lucky thing meeting Ellen for you and for the rest of us. Well, things have changed and, and grown, as you know. And there's Wi-Fi at the cottage. When I got there, there was no running water, and they barely had electricity. And now there's Wi-Fi and running water, 
television. <laughs> oh, God. I know. It's so funny. You've written, I mean, I've been at the magazine for 22 years. And so I've sort of seen in that time, you've written about the cottage and I've seen the evolution of, of your cottage in a sense. Um, you talk about sort of the rhythms of the year at the cottage and how things have changed, how you grew up with no water at the cottage at all. And now, you know, you begrudgingly put it in and and sense the benefits, but also see the drawbacks, it sounds like. That's for sure. I mean, if you don't have running water, you don't have to put the water down in the, in the November, in those moments when it's hailing out and your hands are freezing and you can't get the foot valve off and you're not so sure the compressor's going to work to blow out the lines. And, you're just, and then all you do for the next four or five months is go back home, wherever home is, and frack about whether or not the pipes are bursting. <laughs> It's true. It's true. So much about going to the cottage is like, again, you've written about this too in a beautiful essay about the cottage in your mind. And so much of it, um, you know, there's obviously wonderful things you think about the cottage when you're away from it, but there's a lot of worry as well. Uh, the water just being one of those worries, right? Yes. Winds, fire. Snow. Who, who, who used it last? Yeah. <laughs> that worry too. <laughs> Who's using it at this very second when you're not sometimes even? Sometimes, I would think. sure. Yeah. Um, at Cottage Life, we think of Canadian cottaging as unique, like worldwide. We, we think that in Canada, no one else does it quite the same way. You've traveled all over the world doing your work. And I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts on that. Would you agree that Cottage Life is unique in Canada? I think so. Uh, certainly, I've seen the situation in, let's say, Finland and Sweden where they have uh, very rustic places that they go to, and they keep them rustic deliberately. I understand the same situation in, in Russia, although I haven't been to a cottage there. And we have a daughter that lives in France, so we know what is perceived to be a cottage or a campground there, and it's quite different. Here, it, uh, I think it has a lot to do with cabin fever and, and uh, dreaming of a place that you would like to escape to. I mean, I, I've written in the past that apart from the indigenous population of Canada, we are basically a nation of escapees, whether it was fleeing famine or war or poverty, whatever. You know, my ancestors would be Irish, fleeing the Irish famine and that. So escape is part of our bloodline. And uh, it's a very important thing in our life that we have this thing that we can cling to that gives us faith and hope. I know that sounds corny as anything, but when, when you have a really bitter, bitter winter, as we had this winter, combined with a situation that none of us ever even imagined mm -hmm. with, with this virus, the cottage, if you were lucky enough to have either own a cottage or have access to a cottage, it became a place of, of faith, I think, that uh, you, you would eventually get there and it would somehow save you. And so many people have had that in their heads and, and raced off to the cottage. You even had a situation in, in Ontario where the premier kind of snuck off to his cottage for, yeah. for a day or so. And I understand that. I mean, people were angry with him. And he wanted to touch base, I think. Yeah, it's funny that you say that. The one thing that you wrote in the magazine, and honestly, I can't even recall when you said it, but it, it is so often in my mind when we're working on it. Um, and it's something about how when you're at the cottage, that's where you're your best self. And yeah. I think you're sort of touching on that right now is that we're seeing it particularly during the pandemic as this refuge, but also this return to your home base somehow and the person that you really want to be. Does that make sense? I like that. Yeah. You know, I think I, I can't remember the exact phrase, but I, I think I said something like this is this, this is the address that would be on your driver's license if only it were possible. That's right. That's right. It's, um, yeah, I, I wanted you to, to talk to you more about that in a sense, because I know in my own history at the cottage, there's this funny thing. I, I grew up going to the same cottage. It was my father's family land and my parents built a small spot on it when they were, even before they were married and had their family there. And it's, of course, the home of all of my best memories growing up. But even in, we sold it uh, almost 10 years ago now, but even as I was an adult going there, there was almost something kind of painful about the nostalgia and how those memories of it being a child um, at the lake, it's, it's actually kind of a sadness somehow, but it's at the same time sort of happy. Can you relate to that at all? I don't know if I'm expressing that clearly. Yes, I can. Uh, the cottage that I was speaking of, the grandparents' cottage, was on Lake of Trivers. And uh, other relatives had a cottage not too far away on Lake of Trivers. 
And a few years back, my older brother, Jim, and I, we went up to, uh, he, he was actually staying at that cottage. And I had the canoe on the top of the car, and I threw the canoe in, and I said, come on, we're going to paddle over to the point. Now, the point would be exactly where that uh, log cabin was that our grandparents lived in. He went with me, but he wasn't very comfortable about it. And then when he was there, he actually said, you know, I don't really like being here. There's too many ghosts for me. And so we left and that. And I I didn't share that same feeling. I've always walked out to the edge of the, the point, even by myself, and uh, had, had a very strong feeling and sense of it. Now, uh, we also had another brother, younger brother, and our sister Anne, who uh, just... Uh, coincidentally worked for uh, McLean's magazine. She was a fact checker and you know how important they are in the magazine. Of course. She was, she was a legendary fact checker and she was the one who had to check Alan Fotheringham's call them all the time. So he Lucky called her. her. <laughs> Alan called her my guardian angel. <laughs> and uh, and uh, very sadly uh, went through a, a terrible bout with cancer and, and lost that fight in 1995. And I was sitting with her. Uh, it was it reaches a point where you know that the inevitable is there and there was no mm-hmm. no point in pretending otherwise. So I said to Anne, I said, you know, thinking about McLean's and all that, and I said, what mattered, What matters most to you? And looking back, and she did not miss a heartbeat. She said, Lake of Trivers, instantly. So after 50 years of vast experiences, this childhood moment, these, these childhood moments that... Uh, Lake of Trevor's remained her most treasured memories. Yeah, I can I can so deeply relate to that, and I can see it now too. And I'm curious to know about your thoughts as as you have children and grandchildren. I can see it happening before my eyes to my own kids, and we visit the cottage we rent every summer, and I hope they have that. You know, those experiences of uh, you know just magic, truly, that you think of your whole life. We have. Uh... A daughter in France, uh, she has two little ones, and the little girl is just turning four, Noemi. And we were Skyping with her just about two weeks ago because, of course, you know, now they can't come here because of the, the travel. We had everything all set up. We were going to go there, and they were going to come here. And she just looked up into the the camera of, of the computer and said, I miss Canada. <laughs> and so it just broke breaks your heart now. And her older brother, Raphael, he always comes home and he asks, you know, how the cottage is and how much fun they have and how much they love going there. I mean, they do all the things that kids in Canada have always done. They collect toads. I think to be a toad, it'd be awful because you're going to have more kids putting you in pails than you can imagine. <laughs> and then true. you have to give them the lecture about you at the end of the day. You keep them in the shade and at the end of the day, you have to let them go. You can watch them, but you have to let them go. Yeah, well, and I think kids are just so much more aware of the of the natural world and, or aware of it certainly in a different way than I was or that, than when you were as, as a kid, which is kind of nice too. And that's part of the cottage that's so great is how connected they can be to the natural world at a time where we're less connected all the time. Well, and I hate to put everything in context of this COVID-19, but uh, cottages are places where you should almost have a mass of children, you know, a tangle of children up there if they're doing everything together and they're just forever together all through the entire day and for that matter maybe sleeping six to a room who knows and that's tough this year to lose that i hope we only lose it for part of this year and i hope it never happens again but that hurts well as the parent of a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old i can wholeheartedly agree with you on that it is really tough it is really tough um so just to i wanted to get back to us talking about the culture of cottaging in Canada and how it's it's quite unique. So one thing that I, I've noticed is that it's actually not even unique. It's unique to Ontario, and then it's unique to Northern Ontario, and then it's unique to British Columbia. And I, I wondered if you had any thoughts on that, the differences of cottages uh, across the country. You know, some are camps, some are cabins, some are mm-hmm. chalets. How do you, what do you make of that? Why do you think that is? Well, language is certainly a part of it, depending on whether you call it a cabin or say the lake, or call it a cottage. Now, the, the cottage has uh, perhaps in Canada gained some sense of a little bit of snobbery, I, I think, because people automatically seem to think about Muskoka uh, and presume that we're all living in those monster mansions with the <laughs> six boat slips and everything. Right. But, but 
the vast, vast, vast majority of cottagers do not have that experience and actually wouldn't even want it probably. This simplicity is, uh, has its own beauty, and I think you find that simplicity in northern Ontario. I think that uh, in part that's because of there's a strong uh, Finnish lineage in northern Ontario, and they brought the, the kind of uh, cabin attitudes of Finland and saunas and all that over. And Quebec is very uh, cottage oriented, as as we all know, and it, it's got some of the most extraordinary places. But it also has its own sort of Muskoka when you go down into the eastern, some parts of the eastern townships. Um, British Columbia has uh, quite a different experience. We have a daughter; another daughter has a cottage in the Columbia Valley out there, and uh, I don't know. I, I'm really hesitant to even use the word cottage. It's almost like they have second homes and uh, treat them as such. Right. Um, so, Roy, what's next for you? You've just left the Globe and Mail fairly recently. And so what are you working on these days? I've got a couple of book projects. One is with a, a, an Indigenous native leader from uh, British Columbia, who's a friend of mine. He wants to do a book on leadership. And that's uh, going to be quite the book, I think. And then the other one is I'm toying fiddling with the ideas of doing a memoir, but I'm trying to think of how I could do it in a series of vignettes, you know, tell funny or goofy stories for that matter, different experiences that uh, I have that I haven't written about. Like I helped uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper with with his hockey book. I, I used to be the ghost writer for Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> that was kind of fun. Amazing. Uh, you've had such incredible experiences. It's amazing. Roy, it is such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking time and for sharing all of your experiences. It's it's awesome. Well, I've loved uh, my experiences with Cottage Life. When I used to play hockey with a guy called Al Zinkovitz, and he had this crazy idea to start up a cottage magazine, and I knew it would never work. <laughs> it, worked for, it worked out for him, I think. <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't that wonderful? Good for Al. Worked out for me, too, for both of us. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Leanne Bobechko is back to decode the sounds of nature that we hear when we're at the cottage. She's a longtime Cottage Life editor and our resident nature enthusiast. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Michelle. So today I want to play for you a sound from a familiar bird, one of my favorites at the cottage. See if you recognize it. Huh. I'm totally stumped. I have no idea what that sound is. What is it? That's a great blue heron. Really? A great blue heron? That's that's so surprising. I don't know if I've ever actually heard a heron make a sound, and I've seen them many, many times. I think of them as totally quiet, statuesque even. Well, they are largely silent. In fact, they really only make sounds at their foraging grounds when they're disturbed. So if they're silent, that's a good sign. Okay, so when exactly do they make these odd sounds? Well, like we heard, they make loud, harsh squawks and deep croaks, sometimes what can even sound like shrieks. If they're disturbed, they'll make a series of clucks, a sort of go, go, go. And they make a fronk sound at breeding colonies day and night when alarmed or when being aggressive toward other herons. So, Lynn, you know I love it when you make the sound. <laughs> do that again. Fronk. <laughs> I'll do it with you. Fronk. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so when you say breeding grounds, what do you mean exactly? So they will nest on the ground, on bushes, on nesting platforms, even on channel markers, apparently. But primarily, they nest in trees. But Michelle, I have to tell you, this is unlike any bird nesting situation you've seen before. Do tell. Great blue herons set up nests in colonies, also called rookeries or heronries. These are large, stick nests built high off the ground in secluded, hard-to-reach swamps, marshes, islands, and uplands. And there's an average of about 35 nests per colony which is a lot of birds in one place. It really is. But get this, the largest colonies can number in the hundreds. I heard of one in Ontario that was almost 400 individual nests. Just let that sink in for a minute. That's almost 800 adult herons, plus offspring. It's almost like some kind of Hitchcockian nightmare, like a horror movie. (laughs) I love birds, but I almost cannot imagine that. Okay, so let me help with that. They like to nest in dead trees, often those killed by beaver ponds and spring flooding. And their droppings, which are white and acidic, tend to kill live trees that they nest in over time. Sort of like what cormorants do, right? Yeah, 
So male herons pick the nest site, and then they defend it against other males. When the females arrive, the males shriek loudly and perform these impressive displays to try to woo them. And once they're paired up, they mate, and then nest building begins. Okay, so the nest building. Tell me more about that. Their nests are often about 100 or more feet off the ground, with several nests per tree sometimes. The males collect the nest material, which can be sticks from the ground, sticks from living and dead trees, and they can even pinch them from other nests. They present it all to the female, who then weaves the nest together. Sounds like quite a lovely family situation. (laughs) I guess so. Longtime Cottage Life nature scrapbook writer Tim Tyner describes heronries as densely packed, but also foul-smelling. Oh, Okay, so maybe not so cozy after all. No. But the rookeries are a pretty spectacular sight if you happen to stumble on them in one of your rambles. But maybe it's for the best if people keep their distance for the most part. If humans disturb nesting sites, adults can actually leave the nests alone, so leave the eggs and the nestlings unguarded, which leaves them open to predation by bald eagles and other birds. So what else can cottagers do to help keep these amazing creatures thriving here? Well, in North America, the great blue heron is considered secure, but cottagers can help great blue herons, and all birds really, by keeping lakes and rivers clean, wetlands undeveloped, and shorelines and forests natural. Yeah, good advice not just for all birds, but for all of the creatures we like to have around the cottage, including us, frankly. Um, So Leanne, it's fitting that we would end this season's nature sound with one of your very favorite birds, the great blue heron. It's been so fun and educational chatting with you every single week. Thank you so much, Mother Nature. Thanks for having me, Michelle. It's been a blast. I always thought birds were cool, but I wasn't out there with a pair of binoculars and a dog-eared field guide. But ever since this whole sheltering-in-place thing started, there seem to be more birds around than ever, even in the city. And I have to admit, I've become kind of obsessed with them. Spotting new birds has led to a lot of excitement on my family's morning walks. We're noticing all sorts of new birds that we've never noticed before. Goldfinches and catbirds. And my son even saw a beautiful little indigo bunting a few weeks ago. In my own quest to see one myself, I'm going to visit some local parks. It's my mission to find it before the summer comes to an end. There's just one problem. Sitting stone still in nature will make me a bullseye for mosquitoes. So I need a good bug spray to keep me happy, like off DEET-free mosquito repellent. It works for up to five hours, isn't greasy or oily like some of the other repellents, and it's safe for the whole family six months and up. Plus, it works well over my clothes, and it's safe to use around plastics. So now I can focus on finding that gorgeous little blue bird, instead of scaring it away by swatting and itching. We've been closing the podcast with some of our favorite essays written by some of Canada's best writers from the 32-year history of Cottage Life magazine. For our season finale, we knew exactly the essay we wanted to leave you with. It's a letter written to a new Cottage family by Roy McGregor, who you just heard at the top of the podcast. I can tell you that I've had more responses to this essay than any other in my entire 22 years at the magazine. People have come up to me hand over heart, tears in their eyes, to say how much they love it. And even though I've read it many times myself, I still get choked up at the end. From the spring 2019 issue, here's 70 Years and Counting, read by Pedro Mendez. There's no such thing as a cottaging expert. But after so much water under the bridge, here's what I've learned. Dear Catherine, congratulations. You have just taken leave of your senses. Creature comforts, reliable services, traffic ease, handy shopping— yet are entering a whole new world that, with each passing year, will come to make more and more sense. Cottages, in fact, are for you. Believe me, I know of what I speak. I am coming up on my 70th summer at the lake. Given that I was all of four days old when I was taken to my grandparents' log home on a rocky point on Algonquin Park's Lake of Two Rivers. We stayed all summer, every summer, until the grandparents passed on and the cottage sold. In the years since, As much of summer as possible has been spent at a small cabin on Camp Lake, which receives its clean, clear water from a waterfall on the very edge of Algonquin. You may think that 70 summers at the lake would make me an expert in cottaging, 
but there is, in fact, no such thing. Nevertheless, there are a few tips I might hand on to someone just starting out. Your new place sounds like quite the bargain. Think of it as a good buy rather than an RRSP with waterfront. If it must be considered an investment, think of that in terms of time and family rather than money, but one with guaranteed returns. Your cottage is rustic. No electricity, no running water. I can relate to that. We had no such luxuries in all those years on Lake of Two Rivers. My grandfather was a park ranger. He built the log home, the cabins, and of course, the outhouse, a two-seater. We hauled cooking and washing water up from the lake. Drinking water required that you carry a pail more than half a kilometer along a rocky, root-riddled trail and across a beach to a small spring where a dipper was conveniently kept. For more than three decades, there was electricity, but no running water at our current spot on Camp Lake. No one complained. Then, however, a small inheritance suggested it was time to put in water, septic, a bathroom, a hot water heater for showers, and a small washing machine to cut down the trips to town. You will not be able to resist putting in that water you mentioned, Catherine, but let me tell you, on behalf of all cottagers with a salty sailor's vocabulary, that there will come a day, usually in late November, when your cold, unresponsive hands will have to haul plastic pipe out of the water, twist off a locked-on foot valve, bleed the pump and the hot water heater, sponge out the toilet, blow the lines clear with a temperamental compressor, and fret all winter long that your pipes have frozen and split. There is something to be said for no running water, you know. Every late spring, someone at your new summer place will say that the black flies are worse this year than they have ever been. Every time they say it, they will be right. There will be no ordering in at the cottage. You will eat out more often, but only once the black flies have died down. I know you have children. Oliver, who is seven, and four-year-old Zoe. Youngsters and water are a good mix when carefully watched during the day and before bed. No one, however, is capable of watching all the time. My mother's solution was to tie me to a tree using a length of rope and a leather harness. While effective, this method would not be recommended today. What you can do, though, is institute a hard rule about life jackets and swimming only when a grown-up's there. There will be trying times. You need to stress the importance of respect for wildlife, even to those who are only four years old and never meant to hug that little toad to death. Back in the 1950s, my sister Anne and I fell in love with watching dragonflies hatch. We would hover over them as they emerged from their nymph stage in the warm sunlight, waiting for their sparkling wings to unfold and dry before flying off in search of mosquitoes. We wanted them to stay so badly that we pinched off the wings. Ignorance is no excuse, of course, but it's the only one we have. We left frogs to dry out in pails. We put minnows in jars, tightened the lids, and the next day were aghast to find them floating upside down. Catch and release is a good philosophy for all ages. With our own four children, we made sure that they had a shaded tub in which to place toads, frogs, and salamanders, and made them empty it each day. Soon, you will find the delights of toad hunting will turn to the teen lament, there's nothing to do. The easy solution, of course, is to pack a friend or two when heading for the lake. Choose carefully, especially if you stick with the notion of no electricity and no running water. What lies under the bed at night pales compared to what lies down that dark and threatening wooden hole on which a city child is about to place a bare bum. Use boredom as an opportunity to introduce the delight of board games. Monopoly, Clue, Scrabble, Checkers, and the greatest of them all, Crokinole, are, for reasons never fully understood, pure delight at the lake and of next to no interest at home. And just as it is always advisable to have a good supply of pancake mix at the cottage, it's equally wise to have a healthy pile of Archie comics. The day will come, not long after that stage, when your children will no longer consider themselves children. One of them will ask to have the cottage without you for the weekend. It will happen. It might be about the gang, or as happened to us, about someone you suspect may be more than a friend. Your weekend in the city will feature a great deal of tossing and turning. Yet I am here to tell you this. It will all be just fine. It passes. At some point down the road, let's hope not too soon after, you will be entering the realm of grandparenting, which is the secret joy of cottage life. 
the first sign one sees upon entering our cabin is, Welcome to Grandma's. No rules, no parents, no bedtime. There is a pure delight in having grandchildren there, all to yourselves, where you can say to them, as Rat said to Mole in The Wind and the Willows, Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. I do have some very practical advice for you as well. Hide a key. You will be astonished how often it will come into play. Buy and learn to use a chainsaw. Also, learn how to sharpen one. You do this by taking the chains into a place that sells chainsaws. Find your own old guy, though he may actually be fairly young, and he may be a she. Someone who knows how to do things. Fell threatening trees, jury rig a water pump, fix the roof, solder copper pipes, and can be trusted to use that hidden key. Once you find yours, treat him or her as a god. As gods of cottage country, these people most assuredly are. If you can get in, visit during the winter, even though there is no road access and obviously no central heating. Once you get there and get the place warmed up, there is nothing quite so precious as the deep silence of a winter's day. Understand that your assertion, we even got rid of the mice, is sadly wrong. You will never, ever, ever be totally mouse-free. Live with it. Finally, I would advise you to take time each closing up to appreciate the season past. You will not always be aware of what was notable and what memories will last longest, but many, if not most, will come from this very special place. I came to realize this through my mother, the person who carried me to the cottage when I was all of four days old. Her cottage memories, surely, would revolve around hard work. She had to carry the buckets up from the lake to do the dishes, fire up the wood stove to cook, the stove blazing hot even in the muggiest days of summer, and haul the ice block out of the ice house sawdust. She did the washing, the cleaning, looked after her four kids, and, usually, various other cousins, dropped off the way kittens are sometimes left at the end of a farm lane. Her escape was to go for an evening canoe ride. I would sometimes go with her, she taught me how to paddle, but there would rarely be any talking. It would be so quiet you could hear a trout surface, the light kiss of water being punctured. You could hear every stroke and draw of her paddle. One would think then that she might resent such a life of constant work, but in fact she treasured it more than anything else. Nearing 80, she suggested a return to Lake of Two Rivers. Cousin Don McCormick and I drove her up to Algonquin, and we parked at the side of the road, the parking spot long ago grown over. We tried to make our way down the long path to the point, but windfall and overgrowth made it impossible, so we bushwhacked. At one point, Don held my mother under her arms, and I carried her by her legs as we made our way through a tangle of fallen trees. But we made it. She went around to all the nearly invisible sights, a few stones from the old fireplace, the crooked tree in front of where the outhouse had stood, the piled rocks by the point that had served as a foundation corner for the kitchen, where, it seemed, if she wasn't cooking, she was ironing. If she wasn't washing, she was cleaning up. Then she went and sat on a log and quietly stared out at the water for what seemed like an hour. She knew she would not be there again. Years later, when her mind was wandering and she was in the hospital, the end obviously near, she coughed and I asked her if she would like a drink of water. Yes, she said. And then, in a young voice, perfectly lucid, she proceeded to tell me where to go to find the water. There's a trail back of the big house, she said. If you stick to it and stay by the water, you'll come to a place where you can climb down. I did not interrupt her or even consider correcting her. I sat as she described the roots and rock trail along the cliff and down, the walk across the beach, and the trail that led to the little spring with the handy dipper. I just let her go, the two of us, two different generations, lost in the same memory of where we both, and countless others in our family, spent so many of our happiest days. What I hope this story tells you, Catherine, is that though it is often said that time stands still at the cottage, it does not. The woman who carried her infant to the lake that day eventually became a very old woman. Yet in her cottage memory, she was forever young, forever in love with what would always be to several generations, the most treasured place on earth. Welcome to the cottage. Enjoy. Roy.
That's it for our last episode of the season. I hope you enjoyed listening to the Cottage Life podcast as much as we enjoyed putting it together. It took a lot of people to make this podcast possible. Thank you to Leanne Bobechko, Aubrey Boyd, Victor Genova, Sue Haas, Adam Holman, Julian Humphreys, Samantha Lamb, Megan McFadden, Cynthia Muthiardi, Rosemary Monroe, Meredith Neufeld, Bradley Reinhard, Inga Ruman, Jeb Roberts, Jamie Schwella, Menor Sheikh, Marie Wayne, and Caitlin Wakefield. Sound design is by Shane Warnick. Jonathan Billings wrote our theme music. Catherine Jun is the executive producer of this podcast. The award-winning Cottage Life magazine has great tips and inspiration for cottage living. We have a special subscription deal for podcast listeners, including a bonus issue and a free gift. Go to cottagelife.com slash pod for details. We'd love to hear from you. Post a review or email us at edit at cottagelife.com. To find out more about our magazine, our television shows, and our live events, visit cottagelife.com. I'm Michelle Kelly. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast. I'll see you on the dock. This podcast is funded in part by the Government of Canada.